Hello well, again, folks, in 114. Today we're going to be covering um, what I had scheduled the other half of uh, Wednesday's class. 6-6 um, six, six I had shot already, so it's a separate video. Today is February 17th, and according to schedule, I should be covering 6-6 six, six and 6-7. Six, As I mentioned, I already shot a video for section 6-6. Six, six. And that's posted already, um, so you, if you wanted to, you could go look at that right now, uh, immediately upon receiving this announcement. Um, this video is probably going to take until 5 or 6 o'clock today to upload, at least. Um, the reason I broke it up is because the last video was like 3 hours. <laughs> and I think this one might go long, too. So, um, a 6-hour video is, I can't even imagine... I don't think I've ever shot one that long, but I wouldn't want a chance uh, taking a little day to uh, upload. Anyhow, so I broke it up. Today is interesting stuff. Six, seven. And the packet of material that you, I, in theory, would like to print starts with this page. This is an overview of different incarnations of the the line equation. All of the x's, if you analyze any x's that you see in this diagram, they're all first degree, which means that they have an exponent of one, and that is an option when it comes to actually writing it. Anyhow, they're just uh, basically the x's and the y's rearranged. Right? If you see up here that there are some subscripts, that's where you would substitute a number so that it would still end up being just one x and one y ultimately. I'll go into details in a moment. This is an overview. What's really important here is uh, the nature of two lines crossing, over, overlapping entirely, or never crossing at all, in which case they're parallel. Um, we are going to be discussing systems, and systems in a nutshell is two or more equations at once. So if you were to graph them as line equations, you would. Um, they may or may not cross and that would be the solution where they cross. Uh, graph paper you already have access to, but I would for this, this lesson try to have at least one sheet. And then there are two word problems that I'd like to walk you through. That would be the first one. And this is the second one about mixtures, right, which is useful if you take chemistry. All right, anyhow, if you're following along, try to print that out. I'll go through it with you. And let me turn on my projector here and describe the first sort of diagram. Come on. There you go. I gotta adjust the lights here. Right, and let me get rid of this. to move this over slightly. There we go. Minimize here. Yeah. Let's start with this. All right, this is section six seven, as I mentioned. The other half of Wednesday. Um, you don't have to memorize anything. I would say of the two things that are, well, there's three, that are good to know uh, by shape, not so much by name. Name just helps you differentiate, distinguish one from the other, is firstly the slope-intercept form, because this is how you graph efficiently. You, you have, uh, obviously, a relationship to an introduction to this already. And then there's this, you might have seen maybe if you took high school algebra, the point-slope formula, right? The point-slope formula can very easily uh, be changed into the slope-intercept form, right? Now, as I mentioned, there are these x's and y's uh, that have subscripts. Uh, these would be where you actually insert a number, right? Where you substitute. So even though it looks like you have, well, you have two x's and you have two y's and you don't have that in any other case, 
you wouldn't have it in this case either because you're going to put a number here and a number here, right? But then you would distribute the slope to each of these contents and then maybe move this y over there. The bottom line is that you can rearrange this to this form if you need to. If they give you nothing more than just two ordered pairs, two points on a graph, you can rearrange to the slope intercept form, right? You can write an equation to describe that particular line. Anyhow, you're not really responsible for that. You're responsible for knowing this. And then what's gonna be relevant today is this alternate form. Now, what I want you to notice is that in every one of these cases, there are X's and Y's. That's why I put it in color and why I had made the X's consistently one color blue and the Y's consistently one color red. You may get worried and go, hey, there's a capital letter here and there's a lowercase letter there, the B, and there's an A in this instance and nowhere else except maybe here, all right, and a C and so forth, all right? The capital letters are a job. All right, don't think of them as being important. This is a number that, a coefficient, all right, that would be attached to X. A is in anything. B is in some other anything. C is in a constant, all right? They're just a number in, in, in an actual problem, all right? The reason that a textbook would um, capitalize a letter is just to signify that it has slightly stricter conditions than, say, a lowercase a, a lowercase b, a lowercase c. In the standard form, if something is truly in the standard form, it would be a whole number, not a fraction, not a decimal coefficient, just strictly a whole number. And the x uh, term would be in the front, very far left, and it would technically be a positive whole number. All right? If you see something where there's an obvious x and a y, on the same side, it isn't technically st a standard form, but it's remarkably close to it. And for our purposes, that's probably good enough, all right? Just realize that to be truly in standard form, it has to be arranged like this. X and Y, same side, all right? Versus X and Y on opposite sides. Okay, so if you're given that and you want to put something in standard form, and there are situations where you would want to do that, um, it's just moving things algebraically, all right? If you want to move the X term over to the left side, perform the opposite operation. So if you have a negative X, whatever the coefficient is, subtract the whole chunk and bring it over, all right? If you want to write the standard form in slope-intercept, Again, manipulate it algebraically, perform opposite operations to move over equals, right? It's these two that you will see a lot in section 6-7. This general form of a linear equation exists, all right? It's a concept, but you're not going to really see it too much, all right? It doesn't have any special job, it's just general, right? Everything piled onto the left side so that there's a zero on the right side intentionally. This is usually good for, say, maybe factoring if you had a quadratic. Whew. Can't breathe. Choking myself again, so I'll undo my time. And not do this. You know what, I'm sorry. I'm not stripping here in math world, All right, but it's, um, a little too hot with the camera. And I can't breathe for whatever reason. I think it's from hunching over a lot. It makes it hard to breathe with a tie on. Normally in a classroom, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, normally in a classroom, you have, you know, you're standing up straight and you're projecting your voice one way or another. You're not going, eh. Pop it. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, enough griping. Uh, thank you for your patience. Right. Let's get busy. I'll erase this. All right. Um, I don't think I need this. Let me uh, turn off the projector for a while, and then I'll give you sort of another overview here. Yeah. Turn this light 
on. That's better. Um, there is uh, the title of this systems, right? A system of equations for all intents and purposes. Is a stack, literally, of two or more, right? That's basically what it looks like. Right? When you see a stack of two equations, one on top of the other, um, you have a system. All right now, I want to encourage good behavior, so um, this varies between textbooks. But what you should see, right, to uh, further emphasize that this is a system, is you would see one fancy sort of brace here, kind of like a caliper. You know, it's a uh, hand uh, squeezing a sandwich, all right? And if they're any kind of a human being at all, all right, they should label the equation. So I'm gonna do the first one here. Label it one. And then the second equation, which I will label two, all right? Even if it isn't given to you in this ultra fancy way, where there's the brace, and there are the labels, one and two, first equation, second equation, I would still encourage you, all right, to do that. Why? Because it makes things more clear to another human being that this is what you're working with, all right? A system of equations, all right, is literally a stack of two or more equations, all right? In the case of Mat 114, probably you won't have anything more complicated than just two at the same time, all right? You would need a more sophisticated technique that I'm going to show you today to do something like three equations at the same time. Right. What is the purpose of it? The purpose is to solve, as it is always with equations, right, for more than one variable. And it's works like this. If you have two variables to look for at the same time, simultaneously, then you need two equations. If you had three variables in theory to solve for the, at the same time, then you would need three equations. And if you had four variables, then you would need four equations. And it's like that into infinity. There's an entire subject of mathematics that is dedicated to this, um, this entire course, rather, dedicated to the subject, linear algebra, all right? And it's about something called matrices. It's very possible that in high school, if you took algebra two, you might have seen matrices. Matrices is basically a box with the coefficients and the constants written into it rather than the X and the Y and whatever else, all right? And it is a way to get your calculator to basically produce the variable answers without really working too hard, all right? Anyhow, we're gonna do it the old fashioned way because it's good to understand the foundational information. And you will be empowered by that, right? It's not complicated, you have choices. Anyhow, this is the model that you basically would have. As I mentioned, there will be um, two variables. So let's stick with using X and Y in both cases. And uh, throw in some variables here, all right? Uh, pardon me, those are the variables, but some coefficients. So there'll be A and a B and a C, and just to distinguish it, maybe a D, an E, and an F. And these could be plus or minus, but I'm just gonna go with plus to the model. And they'll be set equal to the constant. So what you may notice immediately is that in this model, the equations that you have are linear, which is a fancy way of saying that the exponents are no worse than the number one, right? Which we don't even bother to write. And it happens to be in standard form. Standard form insofar as having the letter X and the letter Y on the same side of the equal sign. They're not, um, I use the lowercase letters here, 
and that would be ideal that they would be a capital A to signify that they're a whole number, right? And you ideally would want a positive A in the front. It's a technicality, it wouldn't be standard formula as you did. Anyhow, the bottom line is you want the X's and the Y's to be on the same side, collimated like so. Right? It's organized. Um, what more can I say about it before I move on here, right? I can't breathe. I don't know what it is. Water. Forgive me. I go running and I remember out of this breath even when I'm running. Yeah. So I'm just washing my diaphragm. Pace and out when you teach your math. That's, that's definitely not a good form. Imagine that act and just die and fall over. Math! Save me, math! Right, it will. Eventually. Right, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be kidding about things like that. But anyhow, um, this is again the purpose. All right, very important. This is why you do it. All right, solve for one, more than one variable, in our case, two variables. All right. And if you need to check, let me just say that before I erase this. If you need to check, uh, a solution, right? Beware, right? Right? It must work in both equations. A lot of times a person will jump a gun and they'll, go, they'll only test one of them and go, oh yeah, it works, and then move on with their lives. But unless it works for both equations, the letter that you substitute for x, the, the number that you rather substitute for x and y, all right, and you produce a balance of the same figure here and then on the opposite side it equals, all right? If it doesn't work for both equations, it's not a solution technically of the system. It might be a, a solution for one and not the other. Okay. All right. So let me um, discuss what your options are. Um, and then we'll do some examples. All right. I'm going to try to uh, confine myself again. I'm going to rip out the uh, T square. today, but unfortunately, it's much more tenacious and harder to erase. Okay, um, let's draw a diagram to summarize um, methods that you have. I'll put a little heading up here. How um, to solve a system right, you will have one of three different choices really and I'll just kind of put some guidelines here Um, the first method is you solve by graphing, which may be the most intuitive. Right. Um, then is the purely algebraic way of doing it, which I think if you had seen this in high school, I suspect that a person would probably lean doing it this method as opposed to the other two. 
uh, just for the reason that you don't always have graph paper, and it works usually just as well by substitution. And then there's the um, the most sophisticated method, which is potentially um, the most challenging, only because it is multi-step. Right? I don't want to dissuade you from talking from doing it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you several of these. But um, uh, elimination. So maybe I'll use a uh, black because it's more cooperative. Right. By elimination. Eliminated. Okay. Nice to know that you have options, right? Well, part of the reason that I, again, I made this sheet is to kind of guide you. If you choose, right, unless the instructions you know, are adamant and they insist that you do it one way or another, right? if you choose one way or another, graphing substitution or elimination, you may want to, well, you probably need to rearrange the parts to resemble this, the standard form or the slope intercept form, right? They're not always given to you that way. It's really what the matter, the problem is, All right? Um, you know, what does graphing entail, All right? Graphing is literally drawing um, each line on the same graph. same coordinate plane and hoping they cross okay now here's what would happen um, if that were the case I'll, I'll just simply flash this uh, sheet here rather than metal with the, the projector if you graph one line and then a second line, I put them in two different colors, on the same graph, this is the ideal situation, all right, where they actually cross, right? Because if you're looking, again, to figure out what is the value of x, what is the value of y, the solution, all right, it is the point of intersection, that's what makes it very satisfying. The point of intersection is the answer, all right? Now, normally you don't think about it, right? You go, all right, it's a coordinate, you know, x comma y. But it is the solution to the system, right? It's solving both of those variables at the same time. So this is what you hope will happen if you go about the process of solving this way by graphing. What might happen instead is that, well, they don't, they do touch, right? But not just in one place they uh, overlap infinitely, which means that they're not technically parallel in a situation like that. They're the same line, just may be disguised. So if you think about it this way, if having one point of intersection is your answer, how many solutions would you have, and I should use that word instead, when they're touching not in one place, but everywhere simultaneously? They have infinite solutions in that case. And they would refer to it as an identity. Then there's the third scenario, all right? What if when you're graphing, they never touch? If they never touch, then by definition, they are parallel. And although a line exists and then a second line exists, all right? And this is made up of numbers, dots, and so is this. If they don't cross ever, then they don't have a solution in common. So there is no solution for their system, right? They have solutions independently of one another, but not as a system, right? They have to touch to have an answer, essentially, all right? So anything else is just gravy. Think about this being the ideal situation, and yeah, that's the label for it. You would say it's a consistent system with independent equations. When they overlap, you would call it a consistent system with dependent equations. Or you would just simply refer to it as an inconsistent system because it doesn't work. All right. All right. Now, back to this. 
All right, that's basically what would happen here. You would basically draw one line, superimposed upon another somehow, and hope that they cross. All right, what do you need to do in a situation like that? Um, first, uh, you need to rearrange both equations to slope-intercept form. So you want them to be y equals mx plus b, that shape, basically. All right? A y on one side of equals an x on the opposite side. Okay? Both of them. All right? And then you graph. Um, and again, you hope for that they're crossing. Uh, we'll do an example in a moment. In this situation here, um, substitution, I'll use green, just this one moment. Uh, basically what happens in a situation like this is that you plug half of one equation into the other. That is as uh, complicated as it gets, right? And you'll see why I'm using the phrase half of, right? Uh, because you, you, you're substituting basically, right, what the x equals or what the y equals. And it's going to be an algebraic expression rather than just a number, right? And then uh, you, what you do as an added step is you back substitute. So you do substitution basically twice, right? In a situation like this, what you want to do, as far as rearranging is concerned, is to rearrange the equations, algebraically of course, uh, one equation, either one, to solve for either, and it's your choice, x equals something, or y equals something, something, right? In other words, you want to take what is given to you and rearrange the parts algebraically so that you have an x on its, by its lonesome on one side. And then whatever the gobbledygook is on the opposite side, that is the half that you are going to plug into the other equation, okay? Then you plug in, and then you back substitute. And again, I'm going to give you an example of that uh, when we get there. By elimination method is um, a good option uh, to have, right? Uh, but it can be the most uh, alien to a student because they don't do it too often, um, and therefore a little daunting. Uh, and they would avoid it, but you shouldn't. Basically, elimination is cancellation by another name, all right? You're going to try, in this situation, to facilitate a cancellation effect. In a nutshell, that is really what's going on. You're going to try to facilitate a cancellation effect, cause it. That is less elegant to say cause when I could say facilitate, right? All right, and then again, eventually you're going to back substitute as well. This is basically a three or four step problem, right? Um, and I may need to erase something just to fit it under this column. Because I have a you know a landscape rather than a portrait view, as a notebook would be. Um, you want to basically rearrange both equations in this case to the standard form. 
right? Or remarkably close to it. It doesn't have to be perfect. But again, what I mean by standard form, I mean you want it to be letter X and letter Y on the same side, right? Ideally, they would be whole number coefficients, not fractions. But even if they are, it would still be better if the letters X and Y are on the same side. So technically, you want this to be standard form or something very close to it. So that would be this. AX plus BY equals C. And it's both equations. In the case of substitution, it's really just one or the other. Um, and in the case of graphing, you want them both to be uh, slope-intercept form. Now, uh, forgive me, I'm going to erase this because, as I mentioned, I'm running out of board space. And I'll put this adjacent here. That is step one, rearrange it to be as close to the standard form as possible. Then this is the more tricky part. You have to be strategic, and that is something that you only learn to do with enough experience doing these types of problems. Right? Another reason not to circumvent or avoid something is that you'll never learn it if you avoid it. All right? Anyhow, strategically, What you try to do is choose right, which variable to cancel. Eliminate, right? Hence the name elimination. How do you actually cause it to uh, cancel? Step three, right? Basically, the reason that you put things in standard form and then collimate them, that is align them in uh, sort of a, a column of like terms, is that you're going to literally blend together the parts of one equation with the parts of the other equation. Normally you wouldn't be allowed to do that. But in the case of the system, that is exactly what you do. You blend together the parts. How do you do that? You add or subtract. All right, what are like terms? Right. One of them, if you're strategic again, is going to cancel, and you'll see. Blend the equations. Stick them in a blender. Okay. Then there's this fourth step, which is sometimes not necessary, uh, but in the more difficult problems, put this in red. Um, if necessary, you're going to multiply by um, a factor, a, let me rephrase that, a convenient factor. And it's different depending upon the problem and its conditions. You're going to multiply by a convenient factor, right, to promote cancellation. Right. Again, I'm saying convenient because, again, it depends on the unique problem and the conditions of that problem. Right. And then the, uh, the fifth step would be to back substitute. You see that there's a recurring theme here. Back substitution happens a lot. Okay? So, you're gonna to try to facilitate cancellation. You're gonna rearrange both equations to the standard form, which again looks like this, all right? Strategically, you have to decide for yourself, all right, 
what is the easiest thing a uh, variable to cancel, right? How do you cause cancellation? You add or subtract like terms. If necessary, as an added step, you're going to multiply by some convenient number that will promote the cancellation. Sometimes you're intentionally multiplying by negative, right? And you might go, well, how do I do that? Don't get scared, all right? Remember what I tell you. You can get away with murder in math world as long as you're consistent, all right? So whatever you choose, all right, as long as it's strategic would be ideal, all right? It's totally legal, all right? And then you ultimately will back substitute. We're going to do several of these um, so you'll see what I mean as we go about it. If you had, in theory, three variables, there's something called Gaussian elimination. You're not responsible for that. That is uh, the subject of another class. Um, now would be a good time um, to um, take out a piece of graph paper because what I want to do is naturally illustrate um, the graphing method. That is, I think, really the most satisfying. At least it was for me when I first learned about it years ago. And I'll get busy here, adjust the lights again. There we go. All right. Uh... Oh, what the show? This is good. Okay. I can't remember the words to that, but it was uh, Bugs Bunny and Daffy. The beginning of the cartoon always had a song. Right. Oh, what the show, this is it. Okay. Okay. I'll have to look that up later. All right, here's our graph. All right. Um, let us do this. All right. Suppose that you have you are given this system of equations to to look for the solution. I'm gonna sort of write them maybe above here. I'm sorry that this is gonna be dark for a moment, but as an example, first example, suppose that this is your first system. You have x plus y equals uh, four, and then to distinguish it, uh, a second equation. 2x minus y equals negative 1. Right. Now you notice if you're going about the process graphically, neither of these is primed to do that. So we're going to have to rearrange the parts algebraically to make them, you know, more closely resemble the slope-intercept form. Namely, we want to get the y alone on one side. So each time, uh, the blue one first, right, and that's less work anyhow, we have to move, right, the parts around it. So notice that there is an X on this side also. Um, without uh, making a table, but just for the reason that I'm very short on space, if this is a positive on the left side of equals, if I wanted to justify moving just the x from here to the opposite side, right, what would be the opposite operation of adding? Subtracting, right, and there would be a cancellation effect, and then I would have it here, right? To write it more neatly, right, I'll put it here. y is now equal to um, negative x plus 4. Now notice something. When I first moved it, and it's sloppily written here, I just put the negative x adjacent to the 4, because it was in the way. If I'm trying to make it strategically conform to the slope-intercept form more closely, I'm going to be a good little math geek, and I'm going to make sure that the x portion of this, the x term, is in the middle. Right? If I do that, just make sure that the sign is appropriately out in front like so. 
in the case of four, it isn't written, but if it isn't written, then you would assume what? You would assume that the four is a positive, hence it is plus four. All right. Now in doing that, you may remember from last chapter, um, there's two pieces of information that you could easily glean from looking at this. The first one is the easier of the two. This is the coordinate zero comma four. So immediately I'm going to put a dot at the location of zero four. All right, go to the origin. And then if it's zero for X, it's neither left nor right. But if it's technically positive four, it's up four. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, and uh, exaggerate a dot right here. Now because I'm talking about a line, I do need to figure out at least one other point. And in order to accomplish that, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the slope is technically negative one, right? If the slope is negative one, that's the same as saying negative one over positive one. So remember, you could always insert a one underneath anything, and it's totally legal, and you would assume that it is a positive, right? Overall, a negative divided by a positive is still what it was, right? So it's legit, right? What does negative one mean? Negative one means one down, and positive one means one to the right. But it's not a coordinate, it's not what it pairs, right? So don't go back to the origin and go one, one. It's from where you left off. So from here, rather than there, you're gonna go one down and then one to the right. And you could follow this pattern indefinitely if you'd like, right? But you really just need two dots and a good ruler. So uh, this is rather large, so I'm gonna do several of them. Down one, over to the right, down one, over to the right, down one, over to the right. And you have an obvious linear pattern here. I, I do need at this point to purposely draw a line, so I'm going to do that. There we go. I'm walking up the wall here. The lane looks in the bed. All right. Um, try to, as anal retentively as possible, draw this line through the points, these two and purposely overextend it because you don't, need, you don't know how far you need to go really. So, play it ahead. And now we're gonna do the red line. This is a similar situation where we have to rearrange the parts. In the case of the red equation, it's a little bit trickier because it's more steps, all right? In this instance, maybe I'll just draw the uh, table immediately underneath it, all right? So for moving it, I want Y to remain on the left, ideally. So I'm going to have to move 2X, firstly, and then I have to deal with a negative coefficient to adjust it. So if this is understood as being positive 2X, and I want to just scoot it over here to the opposite side, I'm going to perform opposite operations. So I'm going to subtract 2X, that is take the number and the letter, right, the whole term, the whole chunk, all right, and then just plop it over here for right now. There's a cancellation effect. Again, I don't know what X is yet, but all right, by sheer logic alone, something minus itself, even if it's mysterious, cancels. So now I have negative Y is equal to, again, being a good little math geek, I'm gonna put this in front, negative two X, all right, minus one. All right. The only thing that I have to do is I have to uh, get rid of this negative here. So if I do that, I'm gonna divide my negative one here and then each of these terms, I'm going to divide by negative one. Don't make the mistake that people often do, especially if they lack experience, right? They, they'll do it to just one thing rather than both things. Remember, you could get away with murder as long as you're consistent. So if you divide both parts, both terms on the right, everything is hunky-dory, all right? So these cancel. You're left with just y. I'm going to put that here. And the way that this works out with the sign combination of negative two technically divided by negative one is that it is a positive two X. And a similar thing here, negative one divided by negative one is a positive one, all right? Now I'm gonna do what I had done before in blue. I'm going to pluck out the two things that make it easy to graph. I'm gonna start with a Y intercept, which is this half of it here. So if this is positive one, this is the, uh, the coordinate um, ordered pairs zero, one, and now put a dot immediately at that location. 
Right. Um, zero is neither here nor there. It's neither left nor right. So I'm going to stay put for a moment. But positive one is up one. So I'm going to exaggerate a red dot here. Right. And when it comes to the slope, the slope in this case is positive two. So if m is equal to positive two, remember you could write that as positive two over positive one. Right? You could make it look like a fraction, which you really need to. Automatically by sticking a one under it and it doesn't hurt anything. So what does that mean? Well, positive means two up for the y portion of it, top and one to the right for the x portion of it, that is the bottom here. So from this location, not the origin, it's not, a, it's not an ordered pairs, it just involves x, x's and y's. You're gonna go up two, one, two, and then over one, and what a coincidence, it goes right through there, right? And I'm gonna do a couple of these. You only need two, but I, I, it makes it easier for me to draw it. All right, up two, over one, up two, over one, up two, over one. And that is sufficient. Now, I'm going to, again, very anal retentively, take out a ruler and try to get this as straight as possible. That precision um, is very useful in a math class. Right. And overextend line as well. Now, you can kind of tell already where they cross, right? This is a situation that is the ideal situation. And just to reemphasize, I'm gonna put this sheet up here for a moment, right? What happened is exactly what I was hoping would happen, right? That the lines cross, right? Again, don't worry about the, the nomenclature, the labeling here, right? But it is a consistent system with independent equations, right? What we were hoping would happen did. Right. There's a solution to the system, and it's right where they cross. Right. So, since I was careful, and I did this on graph paper, um, now all I need to know to get the answer is to look right here. So here's an eyeball to indicate that I'm looking. All right. right there. That is the solution to the system. All right. What are the coordinates of that particular point of intersection, right? If you go back to the origin, you count over one just underneath it, and then up three, one, two, three. Can I have bad timing? Over one, up three. The solution is one comma three, right? You could put it in fancy braces, right? For presentation purposes, you know? It's just a fancy way of doing that, right? You solved for x it's one, and you simultaneously solve for y, right? which is very satisfying, I think, when that happens. Okay, now um, let me turn off the projector, and we're gonna do a check, right? just to prove a point. Now, as I mentioned, if you do a check, and it would be um, a good, good etiquette and really helpful to you to certify, to validate, to verify that the solution is correct, right? You can do that without graph paper. You could do it purely algebraically. So um, here's what you would do, right? If you're gonna check the last solution, right, right, it must work, for lack of a better phrase, in both equations, right? If it doesn't, then it's not a solution to the system. So um, we're gonna check 
one comma three. And remember that x is one and uh, y is three. If the system was really this, and I didn't write these labels that I really would have liked to have. Um, initially it was x plus y equals four, and then more complicated, uh, 2x minus y uh, equals negative 1, you're going to substitute 1 and 3 with is an x respectively and a y respectively in both cases and see if it works, right? Meaning, does it make logical sense at the end or does it make some nonsense, right? Well, if I put a 1 in here and I would put a 1 in here, then this ends up being 1, and this ends up just being 2. If I put a 3 in here, and a 3 in here, then this is 1 plus 3. What is 1 plus 3? It's 4. 4 equals 4. This is so far so good, right, for the first equation. If I do it here, then it's really 2 minus 3, right? What is 2 minus 3? It's negative 1. Negative 1 equals negative 1, so everything is staring square. Good. It checked in both equations, all right? That is, it balanced. It worked, for lack of a better phrase, all right? So everything is good, all right? We knew anyway because we did it on the graph, but you don't have to use a graph. You could always just do it algebraically, which is substituting, all right? This is a, uh, it's true for both. So therefore, right, it is a solution to the system. And that's great. Okay. All right, now let's try a different problem. Well, no, you know what? Let me try the same problem because you know what the answer is, but we'll do it via substitution. Same problem, example, but using substitution method. Right. So here is our system, once again, with two parts, two unique equations, 2x minus y equals negative 1. And this one was um, x plus y equals 4. You already know what the answer is, and that's good. It should be 1 comma 3, right, is the, the system solution, all right? But we're going to use this method instead, all right? As I mentioned, you have uh, to make the executive decision yourself, all right? Choose either one of these to rearrange to solve for it, right? That is, you're going to get the letter X or the letter Y, one or the other, alone on one side. I think probably the least amount of work is to move Y from here to here, right? Which means that in order to accomplish that, I'm going to subtract Y, subtract Y, which means that this would be X is equal to 4 minus Y. Right. This is solved for x in this case. Right. Now, the instruction is you're going to take half of that, the interesting half, the algebraic expression half of it, and then stuff it in the red equation, like a Thanksgiving turkey. So I'm going to take this half in place of x and insert it in here. All right. This is substitute. This is plugging in. Plug into here. The other equations x. Right? If I had chosen to move the x over and solve for y instead, then I would substitute for y. It's your choice. Right? This to me seemed like it would be easier. Right? 
Why? Because, or how come? Because there's a cancellation effect, just one cancellation effect here. Anyhow, what ends up happening when I substitute not a number, but an algebraic expression in place of this x, is that you get this. You get 2 times the quantity for minus y. And that just happens to be a minus y here, and it equals negative 1 still. All right, enough of that. Right. At this point, um, if you look at the inside of the parentheses, you brainwash at this point, rightly so, right, to go, oh, it's the inside of the parentheses, that's where my focus is supposed to be. And you go, well, they're not like terms, so I really can't subtract them, but what can I do to get rid of these is that I can apply the distributive property, which is just multiplication by another name. Just beware, you have to distribute to each of the contents. Right? So this would be 2 times 4, and therefore it would be 8. And this would be 2 times negative y, which means that it would be 2, negative 2 with a y attached to it. There is still this minus, and it would be technically 1y equals negative 1. Right? What happens when you try to compact this together? Remember, you're sticking with really just one side of the equation exclusively, which means you are following the order of operations. You're, you're simplifying expressions. You're pretty much doing what you're supposed to be doing, right, in terms of the operations. I'm going to try to blend these together. This is a negative 2y, and this is technically a negative 1y. When you are adding or subtracting integers, remember, one of each, you actually subtract, right? If you have the same signs as in this case, then you add. You actually add, which is counterintuitive, right? Because what you see, nothing but minuses, right? A negative combined with a second negative is a bigger negative, bigger magnitude. So same signs, this is negative, that's negative, they're both the same. You're going to get, you're add them really to get the digit. So it's minus 3y. Right? It takes the sign of the larger magnitude, which in this case is irrelevant. Now there is an 8 here, and there's still this minus 1 over here. Right? And I'm running out of space, and I'm getting more and more curved as a person. I'm going to pretzel myself in a moment, so I'll probably fall over. I'm going to erase a little bit. I'll just put this up here. I have 8 minus 3y is equal to negative 1. And I'm just going to go through the motions um, of solving this. As if I made a little table like I do. All right? I'm going to move the 8 from here to here. Now I'm playing the game of algebra. So if this is positive and I want to justify moving this chunk from here to here, I have to do the opposite operation. The opposite of adding 8 is to subtract 8. So I'm going to put minus 8 here and here. And everybody knows something minus itself cancels, so it goes away. All right. And then you have minus 3y. And then you have the same situation as before. Do you add really or does, do you subtract really? When you add or subtract integers, one of each sign, you subtract. All right. When you have the same signs, you add. So in this case, yes, they're both negative, but they're going to make a bigger negative. So magnitude-wise, this will be negative 9. All right. uh, last thing is to move to 3. This is understood as being multiplied. So if you want to justify moving 3 from here to here, right, you divide instead by negative 3, divide by negative 3. These cancel, these cancel. Y, after all is said and done, is negative 9 divided by negative 3 is a positive 3 which we already knew, right? So far, so good, right? Now, why is that? Not to belabor the point, but uh, remember, the rules for combining integers is different depending upon the operation. If you're adding or subtracting, this is what you do, right? If you multiply or divide integers, all right, one of each, 
means that you have a negative answer. Right? If you have same signs, then you have a positive. Right? That's why this is a positive three. Right? Different sets of rules for different situations. Now, you would ultimately have to back substitute. You figured out that y is equal to three, swell. All right, but we also know that the x has to be one, so how would you do that? Well, you would take your three, an actual satisfying number now, and then go back and stuff it in one of these two. So, it doesn't matter which one. Any incarnation of the equations will do, as long as they are um, not too grossly changed. Okay? So, <clears throat> this one on top is probably the easiest of the two. So, strategically, I would recommend this one. I'm going to take, in place of y, I'm going to insert a 3 here. And then if I go through the motions, I need the space, so I'll just erase this. Um, this is really x, therefore, plus 3 equals 4. And then make a little table, move 3 via subtraction, x is equal to 1, as already predicted. All right. So good. All right. All right. Now let me just show you the other two cases because they are weird. All right. And uh, they, because of their weirdness, even if you do everything right, you might reproach yourself unfairly. So I'll show you examples where really one of these other two situations arises. All right, so let's do this. And I'll be a little less uh, uh, intricate. All right. um, here's another example using substitution. Graphing would be fine, but it isn't always necessary. So here we have diagrams to show you what would happen. Is x plus y is equal to 3. And underneath it, a second equation, 2x plus 2y equals negative 4. Okay? I still like to have these labeled. I think it makes it more obvious that this is the first equation, this is the second equation. And this little sandwich caliper is making it a system. Okay, now, as before, the top equation, if I'm going to be strategic, is probably the easier one to manipulate. Why? Because it has less gobbledygook in it, right? So, to me, I would, you could do the bottom one if you want, and there's no sin in that, but I would go, let me just move this y over here, right, via algebra. If it is a positive on this side, to justify moving it algebraically, I would subtract y, there'd be a cancellation by design. And if I did it here, my hands are tied. I'm obligated to do the same thing to the other side for the sake of this sort of Zen balancing act that is the gift of algebra. So you have, in this case, x is now equal to y, pardon me, 3 minus y. All right. And what you're going to do is you're going to take half, the interesting half of this equation, solve to x, right? It's not just a number, it's an algebraic expression, unfortunately. And stuff it in here where there's an x. It's like an apple, right? All right, in here, this would be 2, because there's a coefficient, times the interesting guts here of 3 minus y. And then adjacent to it, there's a plus 2y, and there's a negative 4. All right, and you, again, you can't really subtract these. So you're going to just distribute 2, which is the only thing you can do to get rid of these parentheses here, for the sake of simplifying. This ends up being 6 minus 2y plus 2y. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you're a good little math geek, and who doesn't want to be, right? All right, what you do is you try to compact this down. And you go, well, I know I could add and subtract like terms. But interestingly, this is a minus 2y, and this is nearly identical, except that it is the opposite sign. What happens when you try to combine these two? And you should try to. 
they're the same thing, but uh, in terms of magnitude, but they're polar opposite in sign. So there is, whether you intended it or not, a cancellation effect. And they cancel. And that leaves you with this, which is why this problem is interesting. Six, the thing that is left over on the left, and minus four, the thing that is left over on the right. Now, I ask you, I put it to you, is that right? Can that possibly be right? No. This is baloney, right? You put a cross, no smoking cross out sign for this and go, geez, what did I do? All right, six does not equal negative four. So naturally, my experience, especially, maybe I'm projecting a little bit, but all right, I think a person goes, geez, I'm stupid, I must have done something wrong. All right, because look what I got, this, this is nonsense here, right? Not your fault, right? Your algebra could be flawless, all right? Your arithmetic could be beautiful. And in the end, what do you end up with? A sucky answer that is not your fault. So what you need to be aware of is that this just exists as a possibility. This is not your fault, <laughs> all right? So if it's not your fault, don't reproach yourself, all right? Just realize that it's one of these situations, all right? Graphically speaking, if we were to graph these two lines, they would be parallel, all right? But what happens when they're parallel? They're not touching. If they don't touch, then they don't have a solution in common. And how would you specify the answer in that case? All right, you'd say there's no solution. When you have a number is equal to a different number, as in this case, six is really not equal to negative four, it means simply that there is no solution. All right, so again, we didn't do anything wrong, all right? We didn't do anything wrong, it's just that that situation arose. All right, there are some systems that there's no answer, right? No solution would be a better way to say it, okay? I'm drooling on the floor here. This is terrible. Ah, yeah, yum. All right, gross. All right, so anyhow, the other situation that is possible that is, doesn't defy logic or reason, but um, is still interesting because it, weird and therefore interesting is the following. And that is this situation. Suppose you had first equation y equals uh, negative 2x plus 3. And then beneath that, you have a second equation, 2y is equal to 6 minus 4x. Now, this one, you might be happy, and I wouldn't blame you. You go, ah, good. If I, if I employ the substitution as the, um, uh, the uh, procedure here, the method of choice, it is already set equal to one letter or the other. It's y equals in this case. But what I can do is then take the half of it, the interesting half, and stuff it in here. Okay. And what you would see once you expand upon that, you would have 2, the coefficient that was there, times the guts here, negative 2x plus 3. And then on the opposite side, you still have 6 minus 4x. Now again, you can't legal. You should look here, but you know what's going to happen. You can't really combine these because they're not like terms. But what you can do is distribute the two to each of the contents for the sake of simplifying. You can eliminate this parentheses if you do that. Two times negative two is negative four with an x attached to it. Two times x is, pardon me, two times three is six. And then no, oh, this is weird, right? Already it looks weird. It is sort of the mirror image here. <laughs> All right. Now, let's say that you only half paying attention, right? As the person is inclined to, especially after doing this 800 times, you're like, oh, it just didn't end. All right, but uh, let's say that you go, all right, I'm gonna start bringing stuff around, you know, over the equals here. So I draw a little table. And I go, um, I'm gonna move the 4x because I hate it. So you go, all right, I'm gonna take this and plop it over here with buddies. What is the opposite of subtracting? Adding four with an X attached to it. 
I don't know what this is, but it doesn't matter. It's something minus itself, so there's a cancellation effect by design. And if I did it here, I'm obligated to do it here. So I'm going to collimate these and purposely plop that over there. And then the exact same thing happens. Something minus itself. And again, you might, because it's weird and nobody told you, you might go, geez, I must have done something wrong. Don't automatically blame yourself. All right? Here's what ends up happening. This isn't wrong at all. All right? It's just weird. All right? So look what you got. You got a number equals itself, which isn't untrue. In the case of before, 6 equals negative 4 is what we got, right? And that is just a bold-faced lie. This is false. All right? All right? This is just a falsehood. All right? You can't say things like that. It defies logic. You can say it, but you shouldn't. All right? It just doesn't make sense. Um, anyhow, 6 equals itself. This is true. It's just not what I was hoping for, right? Because think about this for a moment. In a bigger picture, we all, from a little kid, are brainwashed with what objective? In algebra especially. To look for letter equals number. And what we got instead was not letter equals number. We got number equals itself. And you might go, geez, I'm dumb. I must have done something. You might think of me, never mind yourself. You might go, geez, that guy's a real idiot. They hired him, all right? And he's, uh, then you dial up, you know, the president, then you know, the, the college president goes, fire that schmuck, all right? Anyhow, no, um, not true, all right? This is graphically what the situation would look like. It would basically be two lines that are overlapping into infinity, all right? Algebraically speaking, this is the minutia. A number equals itself, like zero equals zero, or maybe even a letter equals a letter, x equals x. All right, what does it mean in terms of the number of solutions? It means there are infinite solutions. Isn't that interesting, all right? So we have the situation so far where there is basically one answer, the normal situation, right? No answer, no solution would be better to say it that way. Or infinite solutions, right? Beware of them. I mean, they may not come up in the course of you doing your homework, all right? But now, you you know, uh, forewarned is forearmed, as they say, right? All right, you are aware. Uh, any situation like that where you have um, a number that produces infinite solutions has another name alternatively. Yeah, it's called an identity. Right. Now, let's get into the elimination method and then we'll do our word problems. Mariana and I were in here. All right, um, I'm going to go back to using different colors here. Teacher, you should be pretty, uh, uh, pretty sterile. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to be careful in here. As I mentioned, when you're using elimination method, and I have a tendency myself to sort of do the work, um, sort of vertically. Here. I'm going to write really what the instructions are, and then try to do everything over here. Um, this is elimination method. You're going to eliminate one letter or another. That is, you're trying to uh, facilitate cancellation. All right. What you have to do in each and every case is decide for yourself all right, what is the easiest thing to do. And that may be a little bit hard initially because you lack experience. You might go, I don't know, it looks like hieroglyphics to me. All right. Don't feel bad. Eventually, if you do anything enough times, you figure it out. All right, but strategically, you want to cancel either the X's or you want to cancel the Y's.
And you do so by blending together, and I put little columns here. Normally I wouldn't do this entirely, right? I just do it over the, the equal signs. I should have scooted this over a little better. You're going to collimate in standard form, it already is, um, the blue equation and the red equation. What immediately, if you intentionally combine the parts from the top and the bottom, would go away? Right? The Y's specifically, without thinking. Right? So, that's cool. You didn't have to do anything else. Right? Let's say this cancels. Right? That means that this positive 4 and this positive 2 are going to amplify instead. All right? So, you're going to get 6x in this case. And this is going to equal whatever 13 plus 5 is, which is nicely 18. Nicely because it works well with 6. Right? How do I solve for x now? I'm going to move the x over equals by opposite operation, which the opposite of multiplication is indeed division. And if I did it here, I'm obligated to do it here. There's a cancellation effect. Well, it simplifies down to 1, would probably be better to say. And then the solution for x, at least, is the outcome of 18 divided by 6, which is just 3. Right? What a coincidence. Right? Well, the other problems, uh, at least the first two, uh, the solution for x is 1. Right? In this case, x is 3, I should say. Um, now, what are you going to do? You're going to back substitute. There wasn't a lot of prep work involved in this particular example, but it is meant to introduce you to this idea of blending together what you normally feel is forbidden. You're normally, oh, I can't put the blue equation in the red one. Yes, you can. All right. I'm going to take this uh, x equals 3 and then back substitute into either one of these. Again, with enough experience, you will be more strategic and you'll decide for yourself well, which one of those scenarios is easier. All right. I would argue that it might actually be easier to do the one on the top here. So, if I take the blue equation for x plus y equals 13 and substitute um, this value for x3 in here, now what do I get? Right. I end up with this. I get 4 times 3, which is indeed 12, plus y equals 13. Okay. And in this case, there's just one more step, right? I have to introduce 12 to its buddy over here via subtraction to justify moving it because it's a positive. Cancels. And subtract here. And what does that mean? It means that when x is equal to 3, y is equal to 1. Okay. As a solution, you would put them together as an ordered pair in fancy braces, perhaps, for the sake of, for presentation purposes. It makes it look nice. All right, it would be 3 comma 1 in this case, as opposed to 1 comma 3. It's a different problem. It has similar looking figures. Okay. Now let's do a slightly harder one where there's more prep work involved. Started with 4x minus y equals 2, and in the red equation here, just because it contrasts nicely, 3x plus 2y equals 7. All right. All right. Um, where's it going with this? All right. Now, a couple of things. I, I've avoided this at this point in the conversation. We want it to be in standard form, right? Yeah, so once you're All right. So just to remind you, I, I, I sort of spared all of us 
from having to manipulate that, but you, you might need to in some scenarios. This mo most closely resembles the standard form, where the X and the Y are on the same side, right? And um, they're um, already nicely arranged. Now, if you try to do immediately what you had done before, which is go straight for cancellation, look what happens. You should be collimated as such. You'll notice that, well, nothing, if I attempt to combine four and three, because they're both positives, it's just gonna amplify, it isn't gonna cancel, all right? If I attempt to combine this, what is technically minus one with this positive two, it will shrink, it will diminish somehow, but it won't cancel entirely. So I have trouble now. What I have to do is I have to strategically um, multiply by a convenient number. To promote cancellation, I need to multiply by a convenient number. The convenient number is going to be a factor that produces a least common multiple, if I wanted to be perfectly technical. Common multiple. All right. So in this case, it isn't too complicated. Generally, what you do is you look at the smaller figures involved. Now, remember, you have to choose a letter ultimately, too. Do you want to get rid of the X's? Or do you want to get rid of the Y's? It's probably going to be the case, once again, just here, that um, the Y's are easier to get rid of. Right? Because the convenient number... that I'm going to multiply this entire thing by is just going to be a, a digit, not a sign as well, all right? If I wanted these to shrink out of existence, that is to cancel, really, then I would need this to be a two here, right? Minus two plus two would cancel the y's. As it stands, what number is it really? It's really negative one. So therefore, the convenient figure that I have to multiply, and I can only get away with this if I do it to the entire thing, which is why I'm encapsulating it. The convenient figure is the number two, right? It is a factor that produces a least common multiple, right? All right. A least common multiple of one and two, technically, All right? If you counted multiples, not to really digress, of one, it would be one times one, one times two, one times three, one times four, one times five, into infinity. If I did multiples of two, it would be two times one, two times two is four, six, eight, right, 10, and it would be into infinity. The LCM would be the first number that matches in this list and this list specifically. So I'm only mentioning this because that's its technical term, right? If it helps, just say to yourself, it's some convenient number, right, that's going to make this look like this, right? Now, as I am fond of saying, I will repeat, but this warrants repeating, right? You can get away with murder in math world, right, as long as you're consistent. So, if you decided to seemingly rip a number out of midair, right, and then apply it to an equation, go ahead and do that as long as you do it to all of the parts, right? Across the board, left side of equals, right side of equals, everything is fair and square in math world, right? So, two times four is four x. Two times negative one, which is really my objective here, is minus two y. Two times the other two, coincidentally here, is four. And now I'm just going to scoop uh, what is in red here underneath it. 3x uh, plus 2y 
equals 7. This is the thing that takes a little bit of experience to really get comfortable doing. Anyhow, at this point, it's nice and collimated, meaning that it's arranged according to letter, stacked vertically. And now I can proceed with attempting to blend together the parts here. So I'm going to get rid of this stuff because it's in the way. So, um, this by design would cancel. We need to, for that to happen in order to solve the equation uh, that is a system of equations. We need to basically get rid of one of the two temporarily. Right? And so we have, this is really a positive four now. Uh, pardon me, this is an eight, ding dong. Right. Two times four is indeed eight. And then positive eight plus the positive three that is there is 11 X. Over here, seven plus four is coincidentally 11, right? How do you get rid of 11 attached to the X? You divide by 11 is a cancellation effect. It becomes one instead of zero when you divide. And then X is equal to, again, just coincidentally one. Right. And now we're going to back substitute this value. Right. We have a satisfying answer, letter equals number, right? but just for one of the two of them. Right. Now, a question that often comes up is, all right, well, where do I stick one? You can put them in any equation, the original ones that you were given, right, or the manipulated version in theory. I would go with whichever is easiest. So, so um, the, um, the one down here in red is uh, unmolested. So let me try that one. So 3x plus 2y is equal to 7. Okay. So you stick uh, 1 in here. All right, in place of x, this is equal to 3 plus 2y equals 7. And then manipulate, right? Move the 3 from here to here via subtraction. Both sides for consistency, all right? 2y is equal to 4 divided by 2. Your y value is equal to positive 2, all right? As a coordinate pair, it would be 1, 2. All right. Right. One more, and then we'll do the examples. So this is uh, 3x minus 4y equals 8. And then in the bottom equation, I'll make, let's see, 2x plus 3y equals 9. Okay. Now, again, um, ultimately, what you want to try to do is to blend together the parts from one equation and another. So a table would look like this immediately, right? I'm using these dashed lines to sort of mm, vaguely collimate them, all right? Anyhow, what you notice immediately is that, well, if I combine these two positives, it's just going to amplify rather than cancel or even shrink, right? diminish, right? If I combine negative 4 and positive 3, they'll diminish, but they won't cancel out entirely, so that there's no progress there. So what do we have to do once again? We have to multiply by a convenient number. All right? A convenient number is going to be some factor that produces an LCM, a least common multiple, right? And it depends if you want to decide to go with the Y's or if you want to go with the X's, 
All right, it doesn't matter which one you do. Um, let us say hypothetically, because I keep doing the Y's, these are smaller anyway, so I'll, I'll try to eliminate the X's in this case, all right? Let us consider the multiples of the coefficients All right, two and three. All right, if you, in other words, if you counted by twos, all right, that coefficient there, it would be the same as two times one, two times two, times two times three, so forth. It would be two, four, six, eight, um, and it would go on forever and ever and ever, all right? Ten multiples are like that, all right? Um, three would be um, 3 times 1 is 3, times 2 is 6, times 3 is 9, 12, and again it goes on forever and ever and ever. That is why when you're looking for multiples, you want the lowest one, the least common multiple, right? So the least common multiple, least common multiple of these coefficients 2 and 3, that is the coefficients of x specifically, would be 6. All right, that is the LCM. Now, the thing is, what is the factor, though, right, that produces that number six in each of these cases? It's going to be a different number, technically. Um, just bears some striking resemblance to the things that happen to be there, all right, and that isn't always the case, all right? Well, if I... Say, for example, and I have to be consistent, remember, that's the golden rule of algebra, be consistent. If I multiply by the convenient number just 2, say, for example, because I know 2 times 3 would indeed produce a 6, right? That's the factor. Then I must consistently do this across the board here. That is the only thing that makes it legal. 2 times 3 would be 6x. 2 times negative 4 would be 8y. And this would be 16 instead, right? right? I'm sorry to stand in the way. Um, if I have to consider now, what am I going to, just simultaneously, which is why this is a more complicated problem, if I'm trying to decide the factor that would produce at least a similar looking digit here, all right, what would I have to choose alternatively? What would be the factor now that would produce LCM6? It would be, not coincidentally, 3, all right? And I could get away with that as long as I'm consistent. The only other thing that I do ultimately have to worry about is a sign, but I'll come back to that, all right? 3 times 2 would end up producing a 6x, which is, in terms of magnitude, exactly what I want. 3 times 3 is a positive 9, and that would be a y. And then 3 times 9 would be 27. Now, again, I'm trying strategically to induce a cancellation effect. Is that going to really happen, though? All right? It isn't, unfortunately, because these are both positive. If I try to combine these to blend together now, what is going to happen? They're not going to cancel, they're going to amplify. I'm going to end up with 12x. And this one will not diminish entirely either. This will be positive 1y. And that would be 13, 43. All right? So it isn't really helpful. Um, what I have to do, therefore, is when I'm choosing my convenience over here, one or the other, doesn't matter if it's the green one or the black one, Make one of them negative, because if you apply a negative strategically to this figure, that makes it negative 6, and then there's a cancellation effect. But then I have to be consistent, so negative 3 times positive 3 is negative 9, this is going to amplify, and then a negative times a positive 9 is a negative 27, All right? So, this is the most involved and probably the hardest type of these, uh, not again, not to talk you out of it, All right? Um, dissuade you. This is the most involved, all right? So let's see what happens now that we took the time to go through all of this trouble. Well, this is finally the satisfaction of going, finally, this goes away. 
6 minus 6 is 0, I don't have to write it. These two, because of the consequence here of our actions, is that it's going to amplify. A negative and a negative is a bigger negative when you add or subtract them. Um, same signs, add. That gives you the digit 17 with a Y attached to it, and it's a negative 17. All right. These are a positive and a negative. So one of each, subtract them. They will shrink, at least, just not enough. What you will end up in this case is you'll get a 11 for the magnitude, and then it will take the sign of the larger magnitude, so it'll be a negative 11. Right. And you admittedly are going to get a sucky number, right? because it isn't going to be a whole number. This is, again, a harder type of problem. Not always is this complicated, but hey, it involves everything that is possible. You now need to move 17 from here to here. So you will divide by 17, there's this cancellation effect here, and then there's minus 17 here. So what does it mean? It means that after all of your trouble, y is... A negative divided by a negative is a positive overall. 11 seventeenths. Right? 11 seventeenths is not a wonderful number, right? <laughs> but it is correct. Now, that is only one of the two of them. So what we have to do now is, unfortunately, back substitute, which is possible. Right? It is, I would, I would say, not really complicated because the procedures exist. Right? We can choose them if we're aware of them. What is annoying about this type of problem is that it is so intricate. Right? It is tedious and time-consuming. Right? Anyhow, I don't want to talk you out of it. I just want you to be aware. All right? You can do anything all right, as long as you take the time. Right? Don't rush through things. I know that probably for your whole life going through math, especially math class, right? Taught by some meanie, right? That they went, hey, you better do this in your head, right? That's baloney. It just gets, forget that anybody ever told you that stupid advice, right? Some things you should memorize. Multiplication tables would be strategic, all right? But when you're doing something complicated like this, right? Don't do it in your head, all right? Take your time. Write it down, all right? And encourage other people to write physically too, all right? You learn better if you write, all right? Don't just type everything. Speech over. Anyhow, typing is efficient when you're trying to communicate, but uh, it's not always elegant or the best course. Right? I'm going to substitute 11 seventeenths, as awful as it is, into either the blue equation or the red one. Could I have used the green and the black? You could. And if it was somehow a little bit easier to deal with, right? granted you have a fraction in this case, so it isn't even a nice fraction, it's seventeenths. All right, then it's not really going to be to your benefit. I think I would go with the red one merely for the reason that the numbers are smaller. All right, so I'm going to do that now. All right, and I'm going to erase all this distraction just not to get bogged down. We need to find x. So in place of y, I'm going to substitute the ugly fraction, 11 seventeenths, right? Which means that this is going to be 11 over 17 in here, all right? That is going to make the equation um, 2x plus 3 times 11 over 17 is equal to 9, all right? Just to get it out of the way. And I will preserve this as part of the answer over here. 11 seventeenths. All right. There you go. All right. Now, a couple of reminders, all right, especially since we really didn't discuss this to this point in the, the semester. All right. It's kind of taken for granted, and it should never be taken for granted, really. In the position of teacher, never assume that anyone knows what you're talking about. To, to explain the minutia, to over-explain is usually better. All right. You need to combine what looks like a fraction here times something that doesn't look like a fraction. So you will immediately put a 1 under the 3, right? And then if you can't simplify first, do top times top and bottom times bottom, which means that this is really 33 over 17, right? All right. Meanwhile, adjacent to it over here is still 2x, and over here 
is 9. Right? Now, if this was a regular ordinary number, instead of what it is, 33 over 17, 33 seventeenths, as odd as that is, you would go, oh, you wouldn't bat an eyelash at this point. You'd probably go, all right, I'm just going to card it over here. And how do I do that? By subtracting whatever it is, right? That's still true, right? Even as, if it's ugly. So I'm going to minus, uh, subtract 33 over 17 here. Now you could, if you want to, cancel that naturally, leave you to x, which is what you want. You could enter this into your calculator, right? As long as you know that the sign is now this, and this is a positive nine, right? And it will spit it out, right? I don't want to talk you out of that because we really didn't get into this conversation. If you choose to do that, all right, there's the button that you must employ. A, B, forward slash C, right? This will allow you to enter things in the style of a fraction. And there's also a minus symbol here, 11 and then uh, 17. Be cool, pardon me, I'm doing the wrong thing. Minus 33 over 17. This isn't pretty, all right, because uh, the 10 to $20 variety of a calculator just has basically two rows, right? So they squash the what would be the forward slash, this line of the fraction to be that sort of peculiar backwards L shape, okay? That will allow you to enter it, and then you could press 9, and it would tell you, right? It would tell you the mixed number 7 and then 1 17th. Right? which would be, if you want to change it to an improper fraction, which would be more convenient, believe it or not. Behind ABC in uh, a lighter blue is something that converts to improper fractions. Right? And it would tell you 120 over 17. Now, the, it's fine to use your calculator, especially now, because again, we, we really didn't get into this. But what would happen, the minutia, right, that you can't be afraid of, don't be afraid of the minutia, would be to change this 9 to a 9 over 1 to make it look like a fraction and then upgrade this to something over 17, all right? 1 times 17 would produce 17 as a denominator. If in theory you did that to the bottom, you were obligated to do the same thing to the top, which means that you would have 17 times 9, which is 63, carry the 6, 9 times 1 is 9, 9 plus 6 is 153 to start with. Basically, what is happening here is that when you add or subtract fractions, you may or may not remember, you can't do it until you have a common denominator. So the problem then becomes this. 153, which is a positive, minus 33. All right? And the result of that is that, indeed, you get 120, as the calculator predicted, over 17, which is ugly, all right, but still uh, a doable problem, for lack of a better phrase. Anyhow, then there's this extra half of it. You would have to, in theory, multiply by two. Well, that's what's going on here. If you want to introduce two to the opposite side, you would have to divide by two. There's a cancellation effect. In this case, what I would do to get started, because we already have a fraction established, is that I would try to use the older symbol for division over here, even temporarily, meaning the colon with the line. If I divide here, then I have to divide there, right? All right? Then you have to remind yourself, when you divide fractions, there's a procedure. Basically, you keep, change, and then flip. Can you make a calculator do this? Yes, indeed you can, and go ahead. Right? There's no shame in that. It's a skill to use a calculator, naturally. But this understand what is going on here, the minutia. All right? You're going to keep the first ugly fraction, as you see it, 120 over 17. You're going to change the operation from what it had to be, division, to multiplication. Right? And then you're going to compensate by flipping to a reciprocal. The reciprocal of 2 over 1 is... 1 over 2, right? So in reality, what are you doing? You're going to basically multiply 127ths times a half. Multiplying by a half is the same as dividing by 2, right? Um, and you could do it brute force. You can do top times top, and you would get 120, and 17 times 2, and get 34, and then simplify as an afterthought. 
or you could be strategic. You could go, well, down here, there is a two. And up here, one above, one below the line, there is an even number, which means that I can simplify these before I multiply so that I have something less ugly at the end to deal with. So there is um, a, a common factor, the GCF is for simplifying purposes. Um, two divided by two is one, and 120 divided by two is 60. It's half of 120. So then it would be 60 times one, which is 60, and 17 times one, which is 17. That is what X is in simplest form. It is as ugly as it is, the improper fraction, 60 seventeenths. Okay, those are your answers. Okay, that is everything in terms of method and all the minutia involved. Now, we're gonna change the subject slightly. And for the last maybe hour, if it takes that long, um, uh, discuss something called break-even analysis and then another word problem involving mixtures. diagram. Um, the subject now is something referred to as break-even analysis. We had kind of broached the subject earlier in section 6.6, but in the textbook that didn't bother really going to a formal conversation until now, the subsequent section 6.7. All right, so break-even analysis is something that is considered in a business course. Right. And basically what it is is, um, like everything else to this point, two linear equations for our purposes. So two line equations, right? Uh, which is, in other words, a system. Right. They will be superimposed. Right, one overlapped on top of the other. Right. Um, it's a little messy the way I wrote it. Okay, now the two equations have names. All right. So in one instance, and maybe I should get out the ruler here. I'll put this here. Give myself a little bit of a boundary when I'm writing. The two linear equations, or to be more concise, the two line equations. Two line equations superimposed are the, I'll put this in red on purpose, um, a cost equation. Uh, which you would associate with uh, something negative somehow. And, and green, as much as I don't like green because it doesn't show up too often, um, an equation for revenue. We use that word, revenue. Um, if cost is, uh, you want to keep in mind with the idea of subtraction, so negative, all right? Revenue is, uh, you want to affiliate with um, positive, adding, right? In terms of business, um, cost is expenses, all right? Or what is sometimes referred to as an outlay of cash. of money, right? Uh, this is paid 
to produce something. Right. Um, revenue is a fancy way of saying the income. Right. So um, if this is out, you know, you're bleeding this, then this is what is in, income. Right. Income is money again. Right. So this is basically what is earned were collected by selling something. Or if you're the government um, taxation, right? It's not really selling, right? Um, but the, you'll hear in uh, government politics, a lot of times the economists will talk about revenue, right? The government's revenue. Where does their revenue come from? Aside from maybe selling stamps, Right, at the postal office, right? Uh, revenue comes from taxation. Right. right. Anyhow, the good news is, right, that these are going to be line equations for our purposes. Right. So we're going to borrow the model that is tried and true. Y equals mx plus b, the slope-intercept version of the line equation. Right. And we're going to modify it um, ever so slightly. In fact, we're going to modify it in a way that it is maybe even more intuitive. Right. Firstly, the labels have to be modified, right? So the model of a slope-intercept form is a y equals something, right? If we're calling this specifically a cost equation, then a logical uh, alteration here would be to call this c instead of y, right? And then therefore the C would be equal to the conditions of somebody's manufacturing, you know, uh, or uh, some business that they have, right? What I would do, and this is why I say it might be a little bit more intuitive, is make it slightly more verbal, right? The model that we're crafting here. The chunk that is the slope, which can close the, you know, controls the pitch of the line, that number, and the other variable, whatever it is, right, um, is going to be a rate that is quoted to us in our word problem. And you could easily identify a rate, how so? By the word per, or an, or in, or in the case of our problem, they chose an interesting word, uh, a piece, you know? You'll see in a moment, right? The rate is this first chunk of the equation, right? Then there's gonna be a plus still, right? And then the second number here, the second chunk, the second term really, is a starting point. All right. In the context of the problem forthcoming, uh, I don't know I said. Uh, that you might uh, be signaled that that is what that is. They'll say the word um, fixed or flat. If you ever talk about flat fees, that means a constant, right? So since the y-intercept in the model is usually just a number, it's a constant, right? So it's flat or it's fixed, right? Anyhow, save this gobbledygook in red for a moment, right? We need to take the same equation, model, slope-intercept form, slope-intercept form, and just modify it unique to this set of circumstances. So if we're talking about revenue, which is still an amount of money, as this is an amount of money, then we're going to change the label here to R. Right? We'll go with capital R. Right? The thing that follows it, the first chunk here, is still nonetheless a term that is a rate that is mentioned, unique to the problem. So they're still going to be looking for the word per or an or in or a piece, which is kind of awkward, right? right? In this context, right? And then the second term is, again, it's going to be the constant, all right? Which is uh, the starting point 
on your graph. Right? We know in the context of math world, the happiest place on earth, right? Um, that the starting point is the y-intercept, uh, right, really, right? But that's because the real world usually is just in quadrant one, you know? Anyhow, so rate and then a constant, rate and then over here, this is still technically, again, because I left it out, a constant. You're right, Mom? Constant. Right. Rate constant, rate constant. Right. We're just changing the label from Y to R here and from Y to C. Right. Revenue, green, this is positive, it's a good thing. Cost is you want to keep it as low as possible, right? So it's a negative, really. Right. Now, there's going to be two more equations to kind of bear in mind, and I need the space, so I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to draw you a graph. So here's me while I erase this. We have established at this point that um, our equation is C equals the rate plus the constant, you know, the starting point, the fixed or flat thing. And over here, we have established that um, R is equal to the rate plus the constant, the starting point. So what is really most important is the abbreviation for right now. Put this over here. I don't want to erase this just yet, so I'm just going to kind of like scribble a little border here. All right, the two things that um, will occur Um, yeah. All right. um, a profit, think of this being green, a profit will occur when these conditions happen, when, to use the abbreviations we have established, C and R. When R minus C equals a positive number, all right, and for P for profit, you know, but it's really just some number, whatever it is. And the key here is that this is positive. Oftentimes they just write it as P equals R minus C. And now in order for that to happen, all right, what does that mean? It means that the revenue is higher in terms of its magnitude, right? and the cost is lower in terms of its magnitude. Even when it comes to the lines that we produce, you're gonna see that that is still true. Anyhow, if you have a bigger revenue than you have a cost, the result is that you're going to get a positive, right? And even if it's minuscule or whatever it is, it is as a technicality, a profit, okay? Now the whole thing is referred to as break-even analysis, right? So what does that mean? Um, this is what it means. I'm going to use black appropriately because black is neutral. So um, um, the break even occurs when these conditions occur, happen. All right? When, just because I'm running out of ink in that. Um, When R, the same equation really, R minus C doesn't produce a positive, it produces zero, right? If R is higher than C, then when you subtract them, it produces some positive figure, right? Something above zero. In the break-even situation, what is really happening is that this is equal to this. All right. So another way of looking at it is that R is equal to C. Right? You can either have it written this way or written that way. All right? This is another formula. Okay. This is again the profit. Right? But the profit is 
dead even, right? That means what? It means neither a profit nor a loss. It is interesting, right? I, I never went into business myself, but it is a fun mental exercise, if nothing else, right? Uh, because it is an application of all this stuff that we are taught generally in math world, the happiest place on earth again. What is it, math, right? right? Now, here's a graph as, of what you might see. Right? I need to get into space, so I'm going to erase something. Erase that here. Um, remember, math world is four quadrants, right? Quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. That's a math world. Right? But real life, on the other hand, doesn't require all of that. Right? Right? The real world, shall we say, is just quadrant one, really. Right? The example from yesterday it technically stretched into um, quadrant four, right? the um, the right side of the vertical axis. But um, usually, when you see a graph, think of any standardized test that you've ever had. They're usually pretty boring the graphs, right? Because they're just an axis line this way and an axis line this way, and they're usually just very badly um, labeled. So we should try purposely label things well, right? Let's start with this. Uh, if we're talking about money, right? Uh, let's say that this is the, this vertical axis here. I'm using a different marker, thankfully. I better erase this because it's too small. And I'm hovering. Quadrant one, right? I'm going to draw up here so I don't torture myself. You have a vertical axis and you have a horizontal axis. It's just the first quadrant, really. All right? The vertical axis is going to be um, the revenue and cost axis. Right? Both of them will basically be standing in place of Y, as we know, right? The, um, the horizontal axis is going to be uh, the units axis, for lack of a better phrase. All right. So, um, number of units. You know, um, sold or produced. Axis. Okay. It's a bit more verbal than it is usually in math world. In math world, we usually just call this X, of course, right? And we just call this Y. All right. But um, this is will be unique to our business math incarnation of this. I'll make this a little bit longer just to uh, have some kind of like a beauty to this. There you go. All right. And over here is still zero, zero. All right. Now, um, the revenue and the cost are different names for what thing, right? There's still basically money, so I'm going to put a dollar sign here, right? And the, pardon me, the horizontal axis is an object, so I really can't put a unit here except whatever is unique to the problem. Problem you're going to see is about trains. So, hey, what the hell? I'll just put trains here for right now. Trains. Okay. Um, anyhow, the two lines are going to work like this. Remember, revenue is a positive thing, so I'm going to associate it with green. All right. So, you may start out maybe lower somewhere, all right? But this will be the revenue equation. It will be a linear equation, and it has a starting point, wherever it is. All right. 
and then there is the um, the cost equation superimposed upon it, right? So it may start someplace else, right? And run this way. I would try to exaggerate it just a wee bit. I failed to do that just now. No, this is not working out because you're a ding dong. Sorry. I'm purposely trying to um, make it a little bit more obvious that there is a gap in between the two lines. And if I make them too close to one another, it's going to fail on that endeavor. So I'm going to go down here, a little bit more exaggerated. And maybe have this here. Graphically speaking, right? Let me get rid of this now because it's unnecessary. Before I erase too much, let me remind you of some fundamental fact. Break even occurs when there is neither a profit nor a loss. Now, graphically, what does that mean? It's when the revenue literally equals the cost. The place where that occurs would be right where they cross here. This would be the break-even point. Right? Which means that it would normally have an X and Y value, right? But instead of calling it X and Y, what are we calling it? We're calling it either R or C for the Y value, or C we'll call it, and trains in the problem that you're going to see, so T, right? Now, interestingly, let me erase this now. When, and I put this in red on purpose, where or when, depending upon phrasing here, where or when the cost line, and that is the line that I have, you know, tried to draw in red here. Right. is above, right. right, meaning it's above the green line, right, there is a loss in somebody's business. So, for example, where is the red line higher up than the green line, right, basically in this shaded region in here. This is the loss area, if you will. Okay. At the same time, where, when, or where, the correct phrasing, the revenue line is above. Right? There is profit. Because right? again, remember, there's going to be this squeeze, right? A bottleneck, basically, where they are zero. Right? But then it, it extends beyond that. So, where is the green line higher up in the drawing? In this region here and beyond it. This is the profit area. Okay. Now, that's everything that you need to know getting into the subject of breaking even, uh, break, breaking even. And now I'm going to walk you through the word problem that pertains to trains, somebody's business of selling model trains. Okay. Just beware of these fun facts because it will be true, all right, no matter what the problem is. Right. Where or when the course line is above the revenue, there is a loss. When or where the revenue line is above the cost, there is a profit. And the squeeze point here, the pitch, 
All right. Um, the bottleneck point is the break-even point. That's where it's zero, zero, all right, in terms of profits and losses. Okay. Um, I already next stuff my markers here. That wasn't wise. All right. So let's look at this sheet. All right, and I'll maybe turn on the projector to this point because I want to highlight some stuff. Take a look at this sheet. This is the word problem I'm alluding to about trains. And I'll adjust the, uh, the light here. All right, long graph here. We don't really need to draw a picture. For this problem, right, um, let me just maximize this. No, that's the pharmacist one. Hey, where's the rest of it? That's crazy. There it is. Okay, I was worried for a moment that it didn't like. Okay, let me erase the. Um overlapping uh, Google here. <laughs> I'm, right. um, I'm only uh, sort of uh, blowing up and projecting this uh, writing because I want to uh, teach you to kind of get in the habit when you have a word problem to not be afraid to scribble on it somehow, not to the point of, you know, not being able to read it being legible, but um, to try to zero in on the information that is really relevant, because as you know, unfortunately, there are some problems that are phrased, A, badly, just because the person was not good at writing, all right, perhaps, yet, all right, or they're intentionally trying to throw you, all right? I hate that. I don't think, especially, listen, if you're going into the field of grammar school education, don't, you know, try to, you know, knock a kid over, all right, you know, physically or mentally, all right, don't try to throw them, teach them how, what to look for, you know, then when they build up confidence, then they will, they will be able to, they'll handle it themselves, right, the more invested time that you have in a little kid, the less work you'll have when they're older, all right, when they get to high school, they'll already know all the tricks, right, I've had a read a word problem, anyhow, at a toy show, Rich, good name for a business owner, right? Can sell model trains. Sells model trains for $35. Save that information. The cost, we have a formula for cost, is gonna be some rate quoted to us, plus some uh, constant, all right? All right? The cost for making these trains are a fixed cost. Red alert, fixed cost is $200. So in place of constant in our model, all right, the cost is going to be um, 200. So I'm going to start with that, okay? All right, and a production cost of $15 a piece. This is a little awkwardly phrased and kind of unusual. They don't, the word a piece doesn't come often in word problems, but this is an example of a rate, all right? So if it's $15 a piece, it means Fifteen dollars per train, you know, or per unit. Right? It's a little bit messy. I'm going to get rid of it in a moment. Right? Um, there is basically two equations here. Right? But one of them is disguised. The cost one is more explicitly talked about. Right? Because they use the word cost in at least two places here. Right? Cost is two hundred dollars flat. Right? and then a rate $15 a piece. So we already have that. The other one that is disguised because they didn't really explicitly state it is this part here, all right? Rich can sell model trains for $35. Fill in the blank, right? The, handling, the, the hanging portion of the sentence in the ether, all right? $35 per, per what? Per train, right? Per unit or whatever. So that is the person's revenue in theory, 
right, without explicitly staying, say, uh, stating it, unfortunately. So I'm going to put this adjacent. R is just equal to $35 per train. And now my queen is dying, and I'm going to get rid of the projected image for the moment. Right? Again, the only person, reason that I blew it up is because I want you to sort of get in the habit of circling the numbers, if nothing else, right? because you know you're going to incorporate them in the formulas that you create. The equations. Come on, go away. Right, now I need to adjust the lights again. All right. So, to clean up the mess that I left behind here, well, we had a projected image. We have established basically this. A cost equation, even without someone telling us, hey, write a cost equation. Well, guess what? That's what the next question is, right? It says, right, write an equation representing Rick's cost, and then write an equation representing Rick's revenue. Uh, pardon me, Rich's, not Rick. What is it with Rick's? All right, anyhow, there was a Rick in some problem. All right. $15 per train. I'm going to start out a little bit more verbally, plus 200. And then I'm going to whittle it down to something that is a little bit more symbolic, a little bit more pure math. All right. So we have that for the cost equation, essentially. And then this more vaguely referred to revenue equation, which is R equals $35 per train. All right. And if you want to be more general, sort of um, build up uh, sort of an arsenal for dealing with word problems, you could uh, swap out the word unit for a problem like this. All right, so this is what we have, all right, to answer um, basically question A, or part A. Cost is $15 per train plus 200. If you want you could, uh, this is the part where you take a little bit more artistic license and you chop it down into the bare essentials, you boil it down, all right? Use a, a letter in place of a word, all right? So C is equal to 15. If it's per train, all right, then technically it would look like that to start with, all right? But you're gonna be multiplying by a number of trains all right, which is why there'd be some kind of a cancellation effect, ultimately, and you'd be left with money. Money added to money produces money, strictly. So uh, a more concise way of writing this would be to simply write it as 15 times T, the number of trains, all right? All right, uh, plus uh, 200, okay? And then over here, something very similar, all right? R is equal to 35 times T. Remember, the word per, um, in the context of a ratio, is, a, is the line between the numerator and the denominator, the top and the bottom. When you're using the rate or ratio, all right, you end up having to multiply, which is why I'm writing this here and here, adjacent, all right, on the same tier, okay? So we have everything that we need now. We can answer part B. All right, part B says this, all right? How many trains must Rich sell to break even, all right? We know that the conditions would have to be as follows, all right? To break even. Um, it's a verb, so I'm not going to hyphenate it in this case. Um, to break even, all right, the revenue would have to be equal to the cost, right? Which means that we can now take this equation, the interesting half of it, and then set it equal to this equation, the interesting half of it, right? In other words, in place of R, all right, write what is interesting about it, 35, with a T attached to it, okay. In place of C, write what is interesting about it on the opposite side of this equals here, all right. 
So it's 15t plus 200, right? And now we can manipulate it, right? To figure out basically to solve for t, which is the number of trains that the person has to sell in order for these conditions to be true. So how do we do that? We manipulate algebraically, which in this case is gonna require us to move maybe the 15t over here would be the most efficient way to do it, right? Not maybe not the only way, but definitely the quickest. So if this is a positive here, to take the whole chunk 15n letter, I'm going to subtract 15t from here and then plop it under its like term buddy here, right? There is naturally going to be a cancellation effect when that happens, right? 15, that's a sloppy looking five, I swear, minus 15, right, is 20 times the number of trains. And then what's left over here is just the number 200. So if I want to solve for t to answer the question, uh, I have to divide by the coefficient. So I'm going to divide by 20 here, and I'm going to balance it by dividing by 20 here. There's again, cancellation effect. It's basically simplified to one, all right? And now I have 200 divided by 20, which you could use your calculator if necessary, or employ some kind of tricks. Pair of zeros, the relationship is the same as just dividing 20 by two, which is asking what's half of 20, right? The answer to this is 10 trains. That's how much it would make the person need to sell to neither lose nor profit. You'd break even zero, all right? Trying not to erase stuff here. Right. Next question. Um, here. C. Write an equation for the uh, profit formula. Right. Write an equation for the profit formula. Use the formula to determine Rich's profit if he sells 15 trains. What that realistically means is Take what we know is true for actual profit to occur, a positive number to occur. That would be this, all right? Um, let me put this in the same color as I have it labeled. And to answer C, we have established, all right? Profit, if we want it to be a positive, not a zero, would have to be this R minus C situation. So what we're gonna do is, again, we're gonna take the interesting half of the cost equation and the interesting half of the revenue equation and then at least start by substituting them. So normally when we substitute, what do we do? We, we, we substitute a number and then more recently we've been substituting algebraic expressions, right? Which is less satisfying, but it still works. So we're gonna do that now, right? In place of um, the R here, we're gonna put 35T, right? And in place of C, we're going to put this expression, which is grouped appropriately, 15T uh, plus 200. You have to be careful of one thing technically, which I'm going to show you in a moment, as soon as I get my big self out of the way. All right? Remember that if this is going to be true, all right, these things are not equal, all right? So there's a minus in between. Now, if there is a minus in between these two, algebraic expressions. You really should just encapsulate the second one, that is the thing that immediately follows the minus, because it's going to be applied to not just the 15, but also the thing that follows it, which is positive 200 to start with, all right? All right, uh, we're gonna substitute the figure 15 trains later, but we gotta simplify first. So we have this now we have P is equal to 15, distribute the negative to here and to here, which means that it's really 35 minus 15, which is, guess what? It's 20 again, all right? 20T and then minus 200, all right? Now, in order for this to end up being a positive number, we are going to meet the, the added condition, which is that we're gonna figure out what the profit would be if he sells specifically 15 trains. Now, before I go forward, remember something. Go back just a moment with me. 10 trains here 
is zero. So 15 has to be, you know, being more trained sold, something naturally above zero. So it has to be a property. So I'm gonna uh, insert in place of T for trains, the 15 that we're talking about, right? This is two times 15, which would be 30, with an extra zero is 300, right? Minus 200, that is there. It means that the profit, uh, when all is said and done, is the difference of 300 and 200, 100 dollars is what the person would profit. Okay. Now to throw things um, uh, a little bit more, uh, to change the situation just ever so slightly, to approach it from a different perspective. What you see in the case of um, question D is this. All right. Question D says, well, instead of being given the number of trains to compute what the dollar value would equate to, what if instead, all right, we give you the dollar value, all right? So how many trains must Rich, not Rick, sell to make a profit of $600 specifically. So we are gonna do essentially the same thing that we're substituting, but we're substituting in a different variable. So I'm gonna take the profit equation that we have kind of thrown together, all right, which is P is equal to 20 with a T attached to it to multiply for the number of train units minus 200, all right? And instead of putting a figure in place of T, as before, 15 trains, we're going to put the dollar value of 600 in place of P here, right? And now we will solve for the number of trains instead, which means that we're just going to go through the process that we know, which is to manipulate an equation algebraically. How do we do that? Via opposite operations, if we're dragging anything over and equal. So, the opposite of subtracting 200 is to add 200. There's a cancellation effect by design here. And if I did it here, the balancing act is to do it here. Six plus two is 800. There's a 20T here. And I have to divide by 20 again. So I'm gonna divide by 20, and this is gonna tell me the number of trains would end up being. All right, pull tricks or use a calculator. A pair of zeros goes away. 80, what's half of 80? 40. Trains is what it would take, in theory, to produce $600. Okay? So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think so. Now I'm trying to keep this way. <laughs> I'd be a terrible man if I were lying. I'm not. I, I genuinely find it this interesting. All right. Now, w the last thing, all right, and we're at uh, two and a half hours here, is this uh, word problem, all right? which rather than turn on the projector, I'll just simply show you here. All right. I'm going to give you sort of a method that has served me well. All right. And if you take a chemistry class, and you, you probably have to do with that at some point, all right, um, start out at least. You can always modify what I give you. Here's a model for dealing with the second equation. This is four mixtures, right? a useful model. All right. Okay, since the, the subject of the class is, of today's lesson is systems, right? Which implies that you're going to be looking for the value of two things that could vary, right? 
mixtures are often talking about a mixture of at least two things. So we're going to adapt basically the system that we have, right? This is the model that we're familiar with at this point, right? Which is that if we have a system, all right, it is a, a sandwich of two equations, right? And they kind of vaguely look like this, ax, b, y equals c, all the dx plus ey equals f, something along those lines. They both involve um, the letters x and y to stand in place of two variables, two things that are being blended together somehow, okay? Never mind the a, b's, and c's. I know that they're letters too, but they're not the variable, they're the constants, all right? Now, the model that I would adapt from this is this. You're going to write your first equation as being a, com a combination of basically a sum of percentages quoted to you and volumes. Okay? That's going to be your first equation. So you're going to have that as the top of the stack, potentially. It doesn't matter if it's the bottom, but whatever. All right? All right? In place of the second equation, all right, you're going to have a sum similarly, but it's going to be the sum pretty much just of um, just the volumes. Okay? So this is very verbal, I know, but the key phrase here is the operative term, somewhat pun intended, is that there's going to be a sum of two things, right? And they're going to have to have a percentage inserted in there and a, a number that represents a volume, right? And in this case, a sum, but it's going to be just the volumes. It will be something plus something else, at least to start with, okay? Now let me read the conditions of the problem. Okay. Um, you know what, maybe I will turn on the projector for a moment. There we go. Eh, it's a bit too far away. That's better. Right. Um, let me just erase a wee bit here. I don't want to get too confusing with the gobbledygook here. Um, a scientist here, a pharmacist, right, needs. Pharmacist needs 500 milliliters, right? This is a volume, right? Of 10% phenobarbital solution. I'm not sure what that is, honestly. All right? But here's a percentage that's quoted to you. All right? So she doesn't have that, though. All right? What she does have is that she has a 5% solution of the same substance, phenobarbital, sorry phenobarbital solution, and a 25% solution, all right? And so, because she has one that is more than 10% and one that is less than 10%, she's gonna blend them together, all right? And since they're solutions, which generally means that they're water-based, all right, they're gonna mix, all right? She decides to mix these to compensate, all right? How many milliliters of each solution would be necessary to mix, to obtain the desired solution, that is to get this situation um, uh, mixed together, all right? Again, I'm going to remove this uh, slide because it's a little bit too much mess in the way, 
All right, and then refer back to my strategy with red and blue here. All right, remember the numbers 10%, 500, 5%, and 25. Okay. So, um, our first equation is going to be a mixture, a sum, pun somewhat intended, a sum of percentages and volumes, right? So it's going to be something with a percentage involved in it, plus something with a percentage involved in it, and it's going to equal the total volume that was there, right? which was quoted to us as being uh, 500 milliliters. All right, uh, of 10%, right? Still, if, again, if you ever feel that you, you, you're writing this and it's a little too verbal and not enough symbolic, all right, don't get mad, it's temporary, right? Start out with something that is natural and intuitive to you, what makes you feel comfortable, and then whittle it down, all right? Anyhow such and such amount of something and a percent plus such and such amount of something and a percent is going to be apparently 500 of this 10 percent uh, solution all right now what are the other two percentages that are quoted to us all right well um we don't know the p the the volume per se but we know that it's five percent in one instance and it's 25% in the other instance, right? So what we can do is, since we don't know what this is, and we don't know what this is, and we can't assume that they're the same thing, write them as two different letters. The model that we are familiar with at this point is that if it's two-dimensional, two, two different variables, is that it's intuitively X and Y. So just stick with that, all right? This represents the first volume, and this represents the second volume. So I'm just above here, I'm gonna write this in green. All right, well maybe in red, but a little bit less messy. It's gonna be X percent of the 5% stuff, all right? Plus Y um, volume of 25% stuff, all right? Is equal to 500 milliliters, if you wanted to attach a unit to it, of 10% stuff. Right. Again, slowly but surely, we will whittle this down. Right. Now, in math world, right, percentages, if you're going to actually use them, right, they can't remain a percentage. You can talk about them in ordinary conversation as that's five percent, it's twenty-five percent, it's ten percent, whatever. But if you're going to utilize them, you're going to do the actual work of you know uh, you know arithmetic. They have to be translated into either a fraction or a decimal, and more likely, because we're, we use a calculator a lot, right? It is probably more convenient as a decimal. So my question to you is, what would 5% be in the style of a decimal instead of a whole number percent? It would be like dividing by 100, and the effect would be to take the decimal point and move it to the left twice which would produce 0 0.05, right? The word of, all right, translates to what mathematical operation? Multiplication, nine times out of 10. So even though it would be X percent of a 5% solution in the context of the problem, in math world, we would more likely put the coefficient, that is the number that we're multiplying by, 0 0.05 in this case, in the front. Right? It looks better, right? arguably. So it would be 0.05x, right? And then the operation here is it's still part of the sum because it's a mixture. And then we pull a similar trick with this 25%. If again, it's of 25%, it's really times 25%. So in order to actually accomplish that, whether we do it now or later, is that this needs to be either a fraction or a decimal. If you convert from a percentage to either of those incarnations of the figure, it's dividing by 100, and the effect is that the decimal point would move twice to the left. 
So this would end up being 0.25 times whatever the volume that is the second volume. And we have to assume, at least initially, that it's different. So 0.05x plus 0.25y. On the flip side here, this 500, and yeah, the unit is milliliters, is already pretty good to go. This is times, and the percentage is 0 0.10 realistically. We can compact that down immediately into just purely a number. It's asking, what is 10% of 500? All right, that's like dividing by 10, and the result would be this. All right, it would be just standalone. 50, all right? This is equation one, as whittled down as it could possibly get, really. It's basically good to go. But in order to solve for two letters simultaneously, you know as a rule, we have to write a second equation with these conditions in order to accomplish that. So we're going to do that now, all right? It is gonna be the sum of just the volumes, all right? What letter have I chosen? I know because I, I sort of took charge here, sorry. All right, what letter have I decided to stand in place of the volume of the first substance? Just X. So if I'm writing a second equation, I, and it's just going to be volumes, I don't have to involve a percentage, a percentage at all. I just have to use the letter X. So I'm going to borrow that. It's going to be X. And then it is a sum of two things. So plus... All right, and then the same thing here. What is the letter that I have chosen myself, executive decision? It's a stand in place of the second substance, the 25% solution. Why? All right, and if we're talking strictly about the volume, what does the total volume have to be? The total volume still has to be 500 milliliters. All right, yeah, it reduced down to this figure 50, but that's as a result of this percentage being applied there, all right? So anyhow, what is gonna end up over here is this, all right? This is gonna be equal to actual 500, all right? Yeah, you can put the units in, but if it makes it more complicated, then don't bother, okay? So now you have this. You have the system. You have the, the math sandwich um, that is, this system. You have two equations, so you could definitely figure out both of those letters eventually. All right, and how do you do that? I think in this particular case, the go-to method out of your three choices, graphic, graphically uh, substitution or elimination, is probably the algebraic way substitution. Because look at what you have here. It's just X and Y, which means that I could easily manipulate this to solve for either that or that. We did that a couple of times, right? So if I were gonna cart Y specifically over to the opposite side of this, I would need to subtract here and subtract here and there would be a cancellation effect by design. And then X would be equal to an algebraic expression granted, but it is some progress, right? So X is temporarily 500 minus Y, right? And now, I'm going to take the interesting half of that and stuff it in the other equation. So, in place of x here, I'm going to put 500 minus y. All right? And I'm going to encapsulate it in uh, parentheses because there is a coefficient that has to be applied to both of these, namely the 0.05. I'm going to erase the unnecessary features here. And this too, because it isn't necessary anymore, all right? I still have the, technically the same equation, it's just rearranged, all right? So temporary, 0 0.05 applied to 500. 0 0.05 applied to negative y. That means that in red here, just to be consistent, all right? This is gonna be like dividing by 20, essentially. 0 0.05 is 1 20th. So, um, that would end up being what? Uh, let's see. Uh, five goes into itself once and goes into zero, zero times. And there's two spaces, so it would be 10,000, I believe, right? Is that correct? Right, let me verify. 
0 0.05 times 500 is, whoa, that's terrible. Oh, 25, what am I saying? Jeez, I'm dividing, I shouldn't be dividing, that's the problem. Multiply, all right, five times five is 25, all right? All right, so we have 25, This ends up being 0 0.05 times 500 is just 25. Um, there's no longer an X because we substituted. This is to our advantage, right? But then we have to remember, don't just distribute to the first figure in the parentheses. Do it to both features. That's what makes it legal. So it's going to be 0 0.05 minus 0 0.05 with a Y attached to it. All right? And there happens to be a 0.25 with a Y attached to it already here. Okay. I'm gonna to have to erase this because it's kind of in the way. So I'll just preserve equation two where it was. It's the rearranged version, the rearranged incarnation of equation two. That is the version of it that is set equal to x. It will be useful later. All right, All right. so what do we do? We try to simplify the little that we can which is this, the like terms that are in the middle here, all right? One of each sign, you're gonna actually subtract, they'll diminish in magnitude, which is like saying, what's 25 minus five, all right? 20, but it's gonna be a decimal, so it's gonna be positive 0 0.20 with a Y attached to it, all right? Meanwhile, there's a 25 hanging out over here, and there's a 50 hanging out over here, all right? Now, we're gonna continue, all right? Subtract, Minus 25, cancels, minus 25. The 0.20 with a Y attached to it is gonna be equal to the difference of 50 and 25, which is simply 25, right? Okay, so now you divide by the decimal point two, cancels here, divide by the decimal point two, and you can verify with your calculator, we get uh, 125, right? Let's see. 125, sorry for the glare. All right. Remember, this represents a volume. So we have just figured out that Y, as a result of this process, is the volume 125. That is the result of these figures being blended together by division. And if it's a unit that's milliliters, it's milliliters, all right? Now, if we want to figure out the X substance, and we were required to, all right, remember now the unit is milliliters. So it's really 500 milliliters minus 125 milliliters, which means that substance X is going to be the difference of these two, 375 milliliters. All right? This is the first substance. This is the second substance. Um, the alternative labeling for these is that this is 375 milliliters of the 5% solution phenobarbital, all right? This is 125 milliliters of the 25% uh, solution, all right, of phenobarbital, okay? So just be aware, right? There's a method for everything all right, it takes a level of comfort, all right, in order to get from here to there, all right? And you only get that level of comfort if you do something a lot, all right? All right, all right thank you guys for sticking with me. It's two hours and 48 minutes. This was section six, seven, all right? So please try a homework, all right? Six, six and six, seven, if you haven't started six, six, in my lab, okay? You have time, naturally, all right, but, uh, as you can see, the two videos between the two of them would be like six hours. All right, all right. I'll see you on Monday. All right, be careful out there. <laughs>